Thanks, everyone. So I hope this is why everyone is here. If not, the walk of shame, you're welcome to take the walk of shame out the, out the front door. That's a terrible thing to say. People actually have to take the walk of shame. Then. Um, so uh, this is what we're going to be talking about today. Let's talk about why we're here. Um, planning, whether it's the, the processes we're going to talk about, the, the documents that we're going to create in order to make this work, um, we want to put those in place. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about why. First, you're probably wondering why I, there's a picture of me with my you know, the international no symbol up there and why I didn't get the same lovely long introduction that uh, everyone else got. Um, <laughs> process is great um, and the end product is what we really want, but the old saying garbage in, garbage out is really important. So I, you're all here, you've trusted that the WordCamp organizers have vetted me, have some sense that I know what I'm talking about, that I'm not going to stand up here and just sell you stuff all, you know, for the next half hour. Um, you need to have, uh, so I, I don't really want to talk about myself, mostly because you don't care. There's something I'm really fond of saying is your prospects don't care about you. Your prospects don't even care about what you do. Your prospects care about what you can do for them. So until you've given them some sense that you can do something for them, they don't care. So you guys, honestly, you, you don't care when, where I went to college or how many decades of experience my team has collectively or any of that. There's no point in talking about it. I really would encourage you to think about that. Um, and adopt that um, perspective, your, your prospect's perspective, um, when you're thinking about all the stuff that we're going to be talking about now, the, the actual content of the documents and the, what you're going to be focused on in this process that we're, that we're talking about. So nothing about me. Um, here's what we're going to cover today. Uh, you can see the first couple of bullet points there are um, sort of the why we'll dive into, the, the heart of it, the meat of the matter there in the middle is the, the how. We'll start talking about all of those, all of those different documents. And at the end, we'll try and uh, wrap it all up together. And, um, and we'll have some time for, for Q&A, I'm sure. So why do we want to do uh, a planning process? Well, because you're going to save time, you're going to save money. Um, as we talk to clients about this, invariably, someone says, well, you've got a couple of weeks in here for this, and you've got a line item for it. Do we really? We, we don't really need to do that. And the truth of the matter is they're, they're overlooking what the, the value is. But for them, the value isn't just saving time and saving money. It's, it, this always reminds me of the, you know, the cartoon. Someone walks in holding you know, huge shopping bags and says, look at all the money I saved. It's like, well, you spent a whole lot of money to save that. So saving time and saving money isn't necessarily that, as big a motivator as you might think for for the folks with profit and loss uh, responsibility. Um, what they are more interested in is risk and reward. Um, we want to be able to get better results. Really solid planning is going to help you do that. Even more than that, they want to not have egg on their face, and they, they want to reduce the risk. I mean, web development and software development in general has uh, sometimes fairly well-deserved reputation for things going sideways when you really don't want them to. Uh, really good planning is going to help you uh, work around that or, or minimize that risk. There's never any guarantee, as, as we all know. So what are our goals? All three of those bullet points are different ways of saying the same thing. We're still focused on better process um, and better product, uh, but when we think about what those things mean, buy and sign off and consensus, there are sort of three areas where they're, it, they're gonna help us. A good planning process is gonna help us. A at the front end of the pro process, if you can get everyone to uh, contribute, you're gonna get a better product in the end, no, no matter what. You just can't know everything, whether you're, you're the marketer in charge or you're a coder or uh, you're the client, you're just not gonna have the perspective to know everything. And I'm already asking you to think about this from the perspective of your um, target audience, being able to do it from all the stakeholders is really tough. So bringing them in is really gonna help you get uh, better results. Um, skipping the middle for a second, if we go to the, the tail end, if you've done that at the beginning, then at the tail end, there's a much greater likelihood that your product, or I'm, I keep referring to it as product, that your website is going to be a success because the folks that you've asked, they've got some skin in the game. They've contributed. They're more likely to think, hey, this isn't something that's just being rammed down my throat. This is something that I help contribute to. This is answering the questions that I have, answering the needs. It's something I'm going to be happy to put out there to my audience. Um, 
those are two reasons. In the middle, uh, the process itself. Um, if you've got a process in place and you um, are very uh, public about that process, it's a lot easier to turn to people and say, no, you don't get two days before launch to come and say, well, where's my job board? We said, well, you know, like, no, you did not say that there was a job board. You've had this experience, exactly? Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> With a job board? <laughs> right, so when someone comes to you, I mean, this person may be your boss's boss's boss, perhaps, and then there's a whole political angle to it as well, but if you can say, look, here's the process, here's where we invited you to give us that input, um, I'll get back to you with what this new request is going to do to our budget and our uh, timeline, but having the process in place makes it a whole lot easier to, to have that conversation. Um, okay, so that's that's the, the the why. Let's get into the meat of the matter, which is these five documents that uh, that we want to talk about. Um, there's well, there are two documents that are missing from this list. One I'll talk about. The other I'm going to leave out there, and we can uh, talk at the end. Bonus points for anyone who can guess what that one is when we, we don't get to it. Um, before I dive into strategy statement, the one thing that is missing here is uh, your marketing plan. And a lot of times people talk about that as part of the planning process and there really ought to be a marketing plan in place before you're putting together a website that is supposed to be all about marketing um, but that really isn't part of this process that's got to be in place already and I'll apologize now I should have done this at the beginning uh, I, I just I'll keep using marketing as shorthand if there's anyone in the room who's uh, works for a nonprofit or um, a, a trade association or something like that that's maybe membership based all the you know it's a communications problem and I, we just sort of default to to, to marketing. All right, so our strategy statement, um, what we, I don't have an example of this, so it's just sort of general uh, graphics up there uh, because it's really just a, uh, a written document. It might be bullet points, it might be a couple paragraphs, but the, the goal here is one page. You really want to do this in a page, maybe two if your site is really complex. Um, and what you want to be talking about is your audience, mostly. You want to be talking about who they are, what their interests are, uh, what it is that you can do to attract them and how you plan on moving them through your, your funnel, essentially, getting them from being uh, visitors who perhaps don't know you at all and just found you in a Google search to someone who's going to pick up the phone and give you a call. Uh, again, I'm making an assumption that it's probably more complex sale that we're talking about rather than someone who's going to move through your website and then click a button and purchase. Um, that may be the case. Um, the, um, I think that, uh, that's about all I want to say there, I think, for now. Um, the next thing we'll move on to from the, the strategy statement is our sitemap, uh, structure, organization, and navigation. We want to take a look at uh, all the pages on the site, or at least all the page types. You don't have to represent every page on the type with all of these documents. There can be a lot uh, to take in, so we want to simplify them in any way we can and make it easy for folks to, to uh, take a look again, hopefully on a single page. Um, here is uh, an example of a sitemap that uh, fairly common uh, arrangement layout. You can do it any way you'd like, uh, but again, I, I would stress that you want to keep this as simple as possible, and you want to make it um, as clear as possible what each thing means. So, if you look under education, there you see on-site programming, uh, on-site programs rather, is grayed out. Um, that's not a page that we decided now not to publish. It's actually not a page at all. It's just a, a, a submenu heading. The, the three boxes underneath that are all on-site programs. The one at the bottom there, Presidium Workshops, is not a, uh, an on-site program. So that's just something you want to put it in there. Your coders are going to want to know. Design folks are going to want to know. They don't need to create a page for this. You don't need to account for this in your budget. It's just got to be there as a menu item. Uh, similarly, under publications, you can see all of those items there have dotted boxes around them uh, rather than solid. Uh, for us, that means that's a password protected area. This is a, a, a site that is both a marketing site uh, with general information for any casual visitors who find it or are directed to it, um, and it is also a site for members. So they're allowed to log in there if they have a, an ID and password. Um, 
but uh, no one else is. Uh, on the lower left-hand corner, you can see that there's uh, those things are noted. There, there are the only instances of things like that, so uh, there's not a, a true legend. It actually just says on-site programs is not a page. Um, the, over on the right-hand side, you see the administrative section. Since we're here talking about WordPress, um, most of our site maps do look like this, where the administrative section is just a, a, a note, right? Because the back end of WordPress is the back end of WordPress. Um, you may customize that using uh, uh, all sorts of widgets and plugins and uh, custom uh, post types and things along those lines. But generally, you're going to capture a lot of that information in the uh, functional spec uh, for our purposes. And all that is going to be captured in uh, a user guide, presumably, that you're going to provide to your, your end user when, they're, when the site has launched. Um, we actually try and avoid putting too much in here about the administrative area because it starts raising questions for the client. Well, can we customize this? Can we customize that? And you, chances are, when you're at this point, you've already given a rough idea of budget. And if they want a fully customized back end, well, that's something that you probably haven't budgeted for and probably something you don't want to you, you don't want to open up the, the can of worms about. Um, all right. Um, the, I will certainly make them available. There'll be a, 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 a URL at the end with uh, some of these. Uh, the, the site map, there's a template that will uh, provide you as a, a PowerPoint template, um, along with a wireframe as well. So I'll make sure that the, I don't know if the slides are there yet, so um, don't immediately go there <laughs> um, when we get to the end. Um, all right, so site maps. Now on wireframes, uh, this is the point in the process that I'd always like to uh, blindfold my uh, clients if I can, because it's really almost impossible to get folks to uh, distance the ideas that we're talking about from a visual representation of those ideas. And you really, you do want to do that. So um, the wireframe, the purpose of the wireframe is to talk about content, talk about the surrounding elements, and not to worry about what they look like or even how they lay out. I can't stress it enough, wireframes are not and should not be graphic design documents. So that means that not only do you want to have that conversation with your client or you know, whoever your, your client may be, internal or, or external, but you also want to make sure they look just this simple. I mean, you don't have to hand draw them, but I mean, really, no drop shadows, no shading, no color, really just keep it as simple as you possibly can. Um, you'll also see that we're trying to portray what was probably going to be a longer page uh, on a single sheet in, in, a, in a PowerPoint presentation, because that's typically how these are done, even if we, we output them as uh, PDFs for, for clients to take a look at. So there are things that we're just going to take liberties with, like that logo in the top left-hand corner. That's awfully small. I, I really don't think you're probably going to put a, a website up with a logo that is so small in relation to everything else. But if you look at what's there, we've got a header, we've got a footer. Those might stay the same throughout the wireframe deck, which, you know, if we look back at that site map, where there are 20 or 30 pages for this site, there are going to be 20 or 30 pages to the wireframe. The main part of the um, of the content there is shown with, it looks like we've got an intro blurb that's going to be superimposed on a photo, and then we've got a benefactor spotlight, which, whatever that is, but that also seems to be looking like a, a visual element and then we've got three content areas there about membership benefits and um, and features there uh, of membership um, to try and drive home this point that uh, our wireframe does not imply visual this is what that page wound up looking like, or it may or may not still look exactly like that. But if you look there at the top in that teal band, we've got our um, intro blurb, and we've got a graphic next to it. It's not uh, superimposed right on top. We've got the uh, our benefactors uh, feature just below that um, with some, some text that we did not actually include in the wireframe. So there are areas where things get a little flexible or just get added, and you don't bother in going back and, and update the wireframes, which isn't necessarily best practice. And then we've got our three blocks that are translated pretty faithfully from what that wireframe looks like as it happens. One more reason to try and keep the um, wireframe conversation away from the idea of graphics or even layout is responsive coding, right? Because this is uh, pulled off of uh, a desktop or laptop version of the screen, and obviously it's going to look very different if we're talking about uh, or looking at it on a, either 
a tablet or a, or a, uh, a mobile phone where all these elements are going to be stacked. So uh, that's it for the wireframes. Um, let's move on to our functional spec. Um, those three bullets there pretty well capture what the functional spec can do or, or what the functional spec needs to uh, talk about, which is what these different kinds of folks can do or what the coding needs to do for the functional specification. Um, functional spec is probably the document that is going to be most varied depending on the complexity of your site. It could be a page long and just a couple of paragraphs and really rely on you know what is built into WordPress. It can be pages and pages and pages long you know for really complex e-commerce sites for sites that have perhaps a membership feature that's much more than just content control but features and you know inter uh, member communications things along those lines the uh, the important thing here is um, that third bullet what the coding does automatically right so think about for a moment uh, say a services page on your website if you sell web development services you have a page for that that. And let's say that there on the right side is a sidebar, right, with related news. And at the bottom, maybe we've got some related blog posts. You've got a lot of choices there in how that gets, uh, that, that those areas get populated. Um, it can be completely free form where you've got a block. You can just have someone type in whatever HTML they want, code it, uh, I mean, style, do anything they want, which is really flexible and really wonderful. And anyone who's a designer in the room is already cringing because they know three months after the site is launched, it's going to look like hell, right? Because you give clients too much, uh, too much control. Um, sort of the, the middle ground might be that there's a box there that you can go in as a, as an admin and pick from any other piece of content on the site and have it loaded. Or the third option is for it to happen automatically, right? You can, with tagging and categorization, you can just say anything that I publish going forward, whether it's a news item or a blog post, if I tag it with web development, it'll automatically appear in this area. So how that happens um, is pretty basic to a lot of folks in the room, I would imagine, if, uh, if we've got a lot of developers in the room. But what that impact is on your client expectations for how the site is going to work, how they're going to maintain it going forward, and whether you can deliver on time and on budget, all that matters, and that's why we want to capture it there. Another um, reason that we put a functional specification together is to capture things that really don't work on, you know, sort of a standard WordPress, WordPress backend page. Something like this, for example, which um, I, I, I wouldn't say it's, it would be really hard to code a page like this uh, on a standard WordPress backend page, but it's going to be really hard for anyone who isn't a coder to maintain a page that looks like this, right? Even if we don't include uh, uh, responsive coding in the mix. So defining, you know, a custom post type uh, perhaps for something like this, defining rules for how order changes, all that is going to be a whole lot easier than some going in and trying to figure out, well, our, uh, our chief marketing officer just quit, but her name started with a, an M, her last name started with an M, and now the new person's last name starts with a B, and well, I don't even know how the rules work. So again, something that you're going to want to uh, define in your functional spec is how any page that really can't easily be coded uh, or it can't easily be ma maintained by someone uh, who isn't a coder, um, how are you going to handle that? How is that going to get done? Again, it, remember, we're thinking about not just budget, not just timeline, but also about who's going to use the site going forward because we want the site uh, to be easy to use. If it's not easy to use, they're not going to make any updates and then the site really doesn't continue to work. Okay, uh, our design brief, um, really, really important to note that a design brief is not a brand book. Um, the second uh, bullet there, uh, that it can include a brand book, um, also gets uh, uh, <laughs> graphics people kind of crazy. But really, it, it, it doesn't have to include a brand book. Um, I think a lot of people would argue otherwise, um, in part because a brand book implies, uh, I don't know, sort of some level of sophistication that, that folks feel like, well, if you're a really small business and you don't have a brand book, well, you're not very sophisticated about your brand. And I, I, that's simply not true. There are a lot of small businesses who don't even know what a brand book is, or branding guidelines, if that's what you'd like to call them, who are still many steps above 
you know, Joe the plumber who just went to the local print shop and, you know, the guy there got some clip art and now, you know, he's got the, the faucet with the drop coming out of it, you know, something, you know, hard, no, I, I shouldn't say that, you know, horribly cliched like that, but y y there's a, there's a, um, a, a lot of middle ground and really what we're, we're not worried so much about the, the broader use that a brand book kind of implies. What we are concerned about is making sure that your designers have the direction that they need and it can look something like this. There are a lot of different ways that uh, the design brief is going to look. Um, they have the information that they need so that they understand what they need to do. It's about audience, it's about strategy and tone, it's about anything that you want to put in front of them so that they, they get a better sense of, of what the end goal is. This is not a, a document that you're going to create and hand over to the designers. This is a document you're probably going to create in coordination with the designers. Um, and this is not the only thing that you're going to hand over to your designers, right? They're going to need the strategy statement. They're going to need the site map. They're going to need the, the, the wireframes and functional spec in order to, to make this happen. So those are the documents. Um, uh, that's the process, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions before we get to them, though. Um, let's talk a little bit about, a little bit about the, uh, the, the process as it should work. Um, essentially, who dri who's driving is probably all of you, right? That's why you're in the room, because you're the folks who have to run this process. And the goal here is really to make it clear that there is one person in charge, but that everyone has a seat at the table, that, that the technology should not be driving the process, the graphic design should not be driving the process. It's really got to be your communications goals, whether that's marketing or something else. Um, and though you control, I say you control the route, um, you control how you're driving along the route. The route is something that is negotiable. How uh, you work as a team, that's completely negotiable, and I would certainly encourage you to be as flexible as you can be within whatever constraints you have in terms of, of time and budget. Um, so to summarize what we've been talking about, our goal is to have a better process and better outcomes, right? Garbage in, garbage out. We want to make sure we're looking at this in the right way, but then we want to use tools that minimize the chances that things are going to go off the rails or that people are going to get distracted or that people aren't all going to be focused on the same end goal. And of course, we want that end goal to be a site that works not just on launch, but going forward. Um, we're going to do that by building consensus, by getting folks to participate in the beginning, getting folks hopefully to take ownership at the end End, um, and of course, having a little bit of control in the middle by documenting the process so we make it clear that uh, there's a time for your input and there's a time for you to have wished you had given us input. Um, but those two times are not necessarily the same. Um, and of course, uh, uh, be a benevolent dictator. You know, evaluate and adjust what you're doing, not just uh, during the process, but really also um, after the fact, right? Uh, if you have the opportunity to build a 90 day review into uh, the process, the budget, and the uh, um, uh, uh, and the sort of break at 90 days after you've had a chance to get feedback, uh, people are using the site, then by all means build that in so that people can see um, uh, what's working, what's not, and you can make adjustments. It's hard to get anything 100% right, uh, right from, from the beginning, even if you've been doing stuff for, for 20 years. Um, so here's uh, the, the URL I mentioned earlier. Uh, if you go to our site, you can get a template for the sitemap and the wireframe. I will uh, add the, these slides to this as well as a PDF. Um, although I think, if I'm not mistaken, all this is available on uh, WordCamp TV. Is that fine? Uh, I think not immediately. Not a, it generally takes a while. Okay, so it'll take a little while. But this, uh, I promise it'll be up there by, by Monday morning. The, the, the template is already there. And best part, you can just go get it. You don't even have to sign up for our email newsletter if you don't want to. Uh, <laughs> but I would love it if you did or if you think that there's more value. There's certainly uh, more resources along these lines on, in, our, in our resource section. Uh, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions anyone has. I'm sorry? Tell us about it. Tell us about the firm. Oh, so now you care. See, I, I got you interested, right? <laughs> um, uh, Andigo is my uh, firm, uh, founded in 1996, although I have to admit I, we were doing uh, desk laptop presentations and set-top box technology. We didn't build our first website until 1998, so we weren't there first necessarily. But um, as we do, most of our engagements are focused on a website at its heart, but but um, we really do a lot 
uh, uh, we have a lot of content focus. Um, we do a lot of this planning work and strategy work with clients to try and help them figure out what they really need and how to achieve it. And then we do a lot on, on the back end where we do uh, analytics consulting, sometimes SEO, but that's not always uh, a part of it. Um, email marketing and all things like that. Um, are there are there other questions? I mean, I'm happy to talk about what we do, but uh, uh, okay. Um, so we, we work with a range of. Uh, Firms, a lot of New York-based, uh, you know, service businesses. As is the case, we're based here in New York. Um, financial services, pharma. Um, we really, although uh, we do pharma through agency partners. Um, so most of our, and and similarly with uh, financial services, but most of our our businesses are small businesses. Although our our focus is on websites in the fifteen to twenty-five thousand dollar range and engagements with uh, ancillary services around those. You know, beyond that, so you know, sort of the classic two-person law firm. You know, that there's just there's not any value to them in spending that much on on a website. Although there's value in the processes we go through. There's not. I don't think there's. It doesn't make sense for them. Go ahead. Sorry. Which software do you use in order to develop the wireframes? Um, you can use any software you like. There are uh, software tools out there. There are you know good old-fashioned flow charting tools that you know have all the different shapes and things that you want to use. Quite frankly, we've got a not, you know, we've been doing this long enough that we just sort of have a library of shapes and, and things and, and social media icons and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's just stuffed into a, a, a base uh, PowerPoint presentation that we then just put together that way. So, but there are, that's a great question. Uh, there are a lot of tools out there specific to it. So. <laughs> um, no, I can't off the top of my head. We've been using, you know, our own sort of in-house tools uh, long enough that I, I honestly can't. Uh, well, I can't. Storyboard. Storyboard. Yeah. It's free. Storyboard. Yeah. There you Thank go. You. Great. All right. Go ahead. Do you do a different wireframe for desktop and mobile and tablet? No. No, and so that, that's another very good question. It gets back to this idea that the wireframe is does not and should not imply layout or design at all. And you know, I get I don't know, ten years ago, maybe the, the answer would have been different because remember back then it was you know andigo.mobi or m.andigo.com or lots of folks had a separate mobile site. None of us do that anymore, really, because people you can't make the determination that just because someone's on their mobile phone, all they want is your direction, you know, your, your, your address so they can get directions or something like that. They want the full experience. Um, so you have to, you, you know, it's just a different way of presenting the same information. So your design documents, which we didn't talk about here at all, um, because that's not part of the planning process, that's production, um, that's going to include all that. There's going to be, whether you subscribe to a mobile first design philosophy or your desktop first, depends on, you know, really should depend on who your audience is, but all that should be captured there. So even if like the information architecture is different? Um, well, no. I mean, if the information architecture is different, then yeah, of course, you should have wireframes to uh, represent that. But uh, honestly, it's been a long time since we've done a site that has had different ar architecture for, for uh, mobile and, and desktop. I'm going to ask this question myself. Uh, do you ever do a purely written text outline very early on, or do you go right from right to the wireframes um, outline? So that's a, 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 another excellent question, uh, which I'll I'll sort of back into the answer. You know, it's not uncommon for clients to say, "Well, don't worry about the, the site map. We don't want to pay you to do that work. We can do it." And uh, our answer is, "Okay, that's fine." No, we're going to leave that in politely. Um, but we really do want your input. You know, this really will help. Um, but we know that what you know about your company and what you think you want to do, combined with our experience and our expertise, is going to give us the best possible sitemap. So let's not cut that corner. And that part of the process where we're, we're discussing with the, the client exactly how, what they are envisioning, and how we can make that work with our expectations for and our knowledge of how you know marketing is 
is going to be best served. That is frequently, uh, I, sometimes it's in a Word document, a lot of times it's just emails back and forth and back and forth. So it, there's, you know, an outline can be really, really helpful uh, beforehand. Uh, what kind of resources and data do you to inform what kind of uh, resources or any kind of data um, do you use to inform the site map? Uh, and do you walk the client through some kind of uh, road mapping exercise? That uh, depends on the um, complexity of the site to some extent. You know, there's some really simple things that um, are just sort of truisms. You know, if we're talking about a site map and, you know, site map sort of implies where, uh, let's see if how quickly I can get back up here. Right, so it, you'll notice the last thing on the right is contact. And the thing before that is about. And like, you're going to have to argue really, really, you have to really advocate strong to get me to tell you it's OK to do something other than that. that the convention is contact is going to be on the right. And you know, Norman Nielsen Group uh, is a really fantastic usability. If, uh, it's, I think it's nngroup.com, maybe. Or maybe that's n at nngroup is where they uh, are on Twitter. Yeah, so I mean, they do a fantastic job and put all sorts of information out there. Um, and, and there are other sources as well who can tell you about that kind of thing. So we'll cite whatever we need to make the case that we're, you know, that we think is important. And you know, what I said earlier about your clients don't care about you, etc. That's why about is last. I mean, except for the contact, right? Like, I don't care about you until you've made me care about you. So that should be last as well. And you know, uh, it really depends on on the nature of the site. But there are a lot of resources out there that um, I'm not sure that I could point to one and say, hey, here, here's what we use. But, you know, just if you're engaged and interested in usability and in, in what works marketing, you know, you can, I mean, I always lose the conversation or the argument about carousels, you know, image rotators. Everyone, everyone loves them. Yes. Norman Nielsen Group will, is not the only one who will tell you that everyone loves them as long as they're thinking about their own website. No one loves them when they go to someone else's website. We all ignore them. You, you know, I track and studies. We, we just we ignore them. But I, I never win that argument. Clients always want those. So, um, so I think I've read that you want to have a site map in the um, files that you're uploading for SEO purposes. And I don't really understand, like, if you're saying it doesn't matter how you create it. Like, I'm coming from more of a graphic design thing, so I'm probably doing an illustrator. You know, how is it that it's helping SEO? Like, how is the crawlers reading the content if it's just created in so many different programs? Or, I don't understand. It's uh, it, you're, it's a great question. Uh, it's a completely different kind of sitemap. That's a, an XML sitemap that uh, is basically an outline in, in coding terms that two separate things. This is just for planning purposes. That is something that, yeah, this, the search engines do need. Hello? the actual content of your site. OK. Right, right. You put, a, a, you put tools in place in it so it updates automatically. And question? Plugins for that. Question. I have two questions. Oh, thanks. I couldn't. I didn't know where the microphone went. Um, one question is: Do you use a, a management tool like Basecamp or Teamwork? And the other question is: What was the missing document? Ah, okay. That's good. Excellent. <laughs> the missing. Does anyone want to take a guess? Because I promised the extra credit. The graphic. A contract. No. The missing. Oh, did, what did you say? A contract. A contract, yes. That, that's the very first document. That's excellent. <laughs> How could I have forgotten that? Um, it's close, uh, you know, uh, homophonically. It's a timeline, timeline. No, uh, content. The document that we're really, I, we don't talk about as part of this process, and sometimes we do, and probably we always should, is content. So uh, frequently clients, you know, are like, well, it's a CMS. Isn't that the purpose? We can load content in the day before we want. Right, and like you know, so you, you, I think you all know where this is going. You end up with a page on the site that has you know 50 pages worth of content, and a section of the site that is 
you know, bare and lonely. And it's because they didn't really think it through. And so you do want content to be part of it, but it's hard. It's a, for us, it's a, a very specific to the project where that has to happen. And it also depends on whether you, are you relaunching a, a site or is it a brand new site? Is there any content to base the, um, the, the new content off of? Or, you know, that's why I, I don't include it in these documents, but it's always part of the, the conversation that you're having as you're, as you're going through all of these. Thanks. Yeah, you know, you pick the tool that you that you like and that you're you're comfortable with. Basecamp uh, is good. Um, we have internal and external clients, or internally we use different tools than sometimes we use with our clients externally. Basecamp, Asana, um, Trello. Trello, and uh, I am blanking on the one that we recently started using internally. Uh, and it'll come to me, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, there there are lots of different tools. Uh, sure. Um, going back to the site map, can you also include the auxiliary navigation and the polar navigation on the site map so on the site map, um, there isn't really navigation. Uh, 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 there, there aren't menus, I'll say. Right? And the navigation is all, is all there. But So your footer navigation probably isn't going to be too different than your top level navigation. You might add a couple of things, privacy policy, terms of use. right? That's all going to be there. But that, that's going to be reflected in your wireframes, not in your... Okay. Oh, next one. Go ahead. You have the mic. Yeah. Uh, uh, is any part of this uh, process specific to WordPress development, or is it generic for all types of site yeah. development? <laughs> yeah. No, it's not. It's. Uh, I mean, this will work. Uh, we're not solely a WordPress shop, and we use this uh, across the board. Even last year, for the first time in I don't know how many years, we did an actual Windows native application, which is just kind of crazy. But and we use the same process. Uh, the question, when you were working with the client, uh, do you have any advice you can give uh, as far as if they're, if they're trying to make one of those decisions um, where they want to remove that contact all the way at the right, for example, um, do you have any advice on how to uh, say no in a nice way? No. <laughs> Just say no. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, I want to know more about this. Remove the contact link. So, <laughs> so if it's if it's like uh, um, you know every it, it's a normal thing to have your contact you know all, all the way, way at the right. end of your nav you know it's it's well accepted a lot of successful sites do this you know right. if they're trying to do to, to remove something that is well accepted just because they feel like it right. you know it's going to hurt them and it's going to be your fault so I don't want to do that <laughs> well so there are a couple of things one. Um, um, if I'm guessing lots of people here have heard of or probably read Steve Krug's uh, fantastic book, Don't Make Me Think, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's a great book on unusability written in, in, you know, very easy to understand terms. Um, I would buy them a copy of that. <laughs> no, I, you know, I would certainly, uh, you know, I would, I would talk about that. Um, if it's, I mean, obviously no one's going to remove the contact button, but if they want to move it, you can, whether it's Nielsen Norman or anyone else you do you can just go do a Google search and come up with a great source that says hey this is why this doesn't work the harder questions are when you know you have a conversation and gosh we've uh, it's always the spouse and I hate to use the spouse as the <laughs> but so let's just say you know the executive who is you know three levels above and hasn't really had any hands-on uh, you know uh, contact with the project at the last minute you know has to uh, you know sign off and says well my niece just graduated with the degree in graphic design, and she says purple's the new color. And like, I mean, that's a really hard, you know, conversation to have. But you know, we've had it with, and not to make it some really long story, but Verizon very famously um, had call to action buttons on their site. And if you think of Verizon, it's red, black, and gray. And well, of course, we're going to make the call to action buttons red because that's going to outperform black or gray. And then they did uh, A/B testing, did multivariate testing, and they were wrong. That just did that. It did not prove out the gray buttons were the ones that performed best. So you, I, you, if you're, no matter what you're battling, you, you've got 
to come up with um, with data to back your your argument, or at the very least, you need to um, you really do need to be polite. <laughs> and you know, there's a political angle to you know talking about. All right, let's you know, I see what you're trying to do here. Let's talk about ways to accomplish what you want without you know confounding your visitors. Saying you have the right buttons work fastest. Is there a general rule of thumbs, best practices for this stuff? For the whole process. Is there, is there some place that you can call the best practices? Um, uh, if there is, I don't know it, and I, I would, and I would say probably not. I had a really interesting conversation with. Um, I'm scanning the, the crowd to see if she's here. Another presenter who's presenting tomorrow, who takes a completely different approach to wireframing, and she and her team are so adept at using the, the visual building tools, I forget which one she uses, in WordPress, that they just start, they start building pages. They, I shouldn't say that. They build a, home, a homepage, and they present that to the client, and they can sit there in a meeting and move elements around. That's a pretty fascinating approach. It never even occurred to me, in part because my team doesn't use visual building tools. Um, but, you know, that, so are there best practices? I wouldn't say there aren't best approaches. There are a lot of different ways to skin the cat. Is um, mind map or you know any of those brainstorming tools are really great very early in the process but um, if you're gathering ideas and you're trying to put that strategy document together but again it has to be something that your the all your stakeholders are are game to use whether you choose to use that in the end I think you know the conversation needs to be more free flowing than that than asking people to contribute to a, a mind map or something like that how specific do you get in the design brief? <laughs> um, how specific do you get in the design brief? Uh, and they're uh, as specific as we can without feeling like you're hemming in your design team, you know, which hopefully means you really do have your design team involved right from the start of, of how that's going to look so that they have uh, impact with, you know, obviously, you know, what whoever on the client side or, or you know, final sign off side um, has input as well. But, um, I, you know, that's also an up and down kind of a thing. So then, what, to what level is the decision made around the final look and feel of the website to their clients? Is that solo design? Is that a combination of? Is it up? Where in the process do you talk about what the website's going to wind up looking like? So that's that's part of the design conversation, and yeah, of course. So the design process is going to uh, feed off of all these documents that we've created, right? And the designers are going to um, come up with how they envision that, and that um, is less document driven than process driven. What happens next, which is um, hopefully the designer does not have a direct line to the client, right? The, Hopefully the designer goes through the rest of the team to make sure that everyone's needs have been met. Does the design, does this, this execution match what we had envisioned in terms of what we feel we needed to do from it? Is it going to be doable from a technology standpoint? I can't think of too many things anymore that are, um, that are really hard from a, a technical standpoint, you know, design-wise. But it used to be, boy, stuff with, you know, like trying to arrange a menu along a curved, you know, graphic, and you know, all of a sudden things were, you know, it, 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 it was like, well, we can do that. We just need twice the budget, right? So you certainly want to make sure technology has uh, whoever's head of the tech team has a chance to sign off on that, and you want to make sure that the design really does work from a, a communication standpoint, from you know, meeting your marketing goals. Did you put in? Uh, Space for calls to actions, or is there an email newsletter sign up on every page, or you know, if that was one of your your goals, you you know, it really gets down to that level of granularity, um, and then once you've all agreed on that, then it goes to the the client, the internal external. Uh, well, it, right. 
We don't always win those arguments, though, right? I mean, it's always client driven. They 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 have the final yes or no, but you want to be able to uh, state your case with enough info, you know, enough data behind it that you you know that you're. It's not just you saying, well, my way's better. Um, that's not terribly popular. But uh, what I, I thought I took your question to mean, well, how does it? How do you get to the point where you? Well, sort of. How do you get to the point where you know you're done? Like that does. Right, yeah. yeah, and that's right. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly right. We want that, and then the client can decide they don't like it. And I think I think we're gonna have to wrap up soon. Okay. Oh, one last quick question, anybody, before we. Hi. So um, I, you mentioned that you do sites for people in the finance industry, right? I sell insurance, so I built my website to actually collect leads and, um, and um, you know, using content marketing and so forth, the whole nine yards. So my question is, I have my site put together. Um, it's generating leads, and I got permission. I sought permission from all the insurance companies I represent to actually put their logo on my site. Great. And then all of a sudden, one of my insurance companies gave me all this compliance. I mean, you're looking at maybe two, three pages of just paragraph after paragraph. <laughs> what do you do in that instance? I mean, it has to be there. It blows the whole design up. Yeah. Do you have any um, suggestions? Does any do it? Is like a new design? I mean, what what do you do in that case? So, if they're giving you, you know, page after page after page of content that needs to be on the site because their logos there, uh -huh. um, I think that depends on on how important they are. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And what their guidelines are. If it can go in the footer, you know, if you can put an asterisk next to the logo and then in their in their footer in, in the footer of your page, put it there. But if they say no, it needs to be you know, uh, I forget the word they always use that, you know, it has to be right there with our logo. I think you have to respectfully decline. You know, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, even financial well, services. Doing a 40 yeah, but a lot, most of the time that's not going to meet the needs in, in our experience. So um, it, it, you have to see how, how tough they are on it. Guys, I think we did it. Let's give Andrew a big round of Thank applause. You guys. I, I was I wish we had more time, but we have to clear out. We have to go party. We 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 did all the WordPress today and it was awesome. And thanks everyone for coming out. That was that was great. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, everyone. So yeah, see you at the after.